I'll change the way we go. I don't know. Give it an opportunity. Yeah, it's just a two different groups in this room because of the dash. Okay, we're going to get started today. Our final colloquium, colloquium of the uh, academic year, and I'd like to really thank the organizers of the colloquium series, the faculty and student organizers, for uh, bringing in some really great speakers over the course of this uh, academic year. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Dr. James Doyle, a senior scientist and head of the mesoscale modeling section within the Marine Meteorology Division of the Naval Research Laboratory in Monterey, California. Jim received his BS degree in atmospheric science and mathematics from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in 1982 and his master's and PhD in meteorology from Penn State in 1986 and 1991 respectively. <laughs> he uh, subsequently joined NRL in 1991 as a research scientist. Having published over 195 peer-reviewed publications, Jim has received some uh, numerous awards from NRL, 14 NRL Allen Berman Outstanding Publication Awards, uh, an award for most cited uh, article. Um, his uh, work across the community, uh, he's reached a NASA Group Achievement Award hurricane and, uh, for the Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel Program, and the NRL 75th Anniversary Award for Innovation. He leads the development team of the Navy's Operational Coamps TC, it's a tropical cyclone model, and one of the lead scientists for the mesoscale coupled system Coamps and the Navy's next generation model, Neptune. He also leads basic research programs on Arctic meteorology, tropical cyclones, high impact weather, and mesoscale predictability. And he's a fellow of the AMS and AGU. Um, these are always accolades, and these awards are certainly um, ones that are deserving of Jim. But and it's, in addition to being an exceptional scientist, he's just a great person. I've known Jim for several years, and our work on sort of adjoint sensitivities, things like that, that my group has been doing, and we've had uh, really fruitful collaborations with Jim. And it's really great to see you back in our department again for a visit. And I'm looking forward to your talk today, Arctic Cyclones and the Influence on Short-Term Sea Ice Change and Moisture Transport. So welcome again to Madison. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here. I really appreciate uh, the invitation from Michael and his group, and I appreciate Zoe's uh, help with the coordinating the visit. And um, it's been a great visit. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, um, and I as a young person, um, we always thought, um, you know, my brothers and sister thought this Madison was Nirvana. It was a great place to come and spend time as a kid and um, do things. So it's really great to be back here and uh, really appreciate it. And it's been a great day of meetings as well. It's been super to meet with the faculty and students. So really enjoyed it. So um, this presentation, um, I'd like to mention uh, very prominently, my colleagues uh, Pete Pinocchio, Dan Stern, Matt Fearon, and Neil Barton, um, all of NRL. Neil's actually moved on recently to NOAA, um, but all of them are really responsible for many of the aspects of the results you'll see today, so they deserve a lot of credit for um, some of the material in this talk. So the outline for this talk, I'll begin with some background about the Arctic and ch the changing Arctic. And I'll uh, discuss some coupled model results for a single Arctic cyclone, then uh, provide a reanalysis perspective of Arctic cyclones and sea ice loss or change, and then uh, end with some uh, perspectives on uh, moisture transport into the Arctic associated with atmospheric river-like uh, features, and then somewhere else. Okay, so um, uh, first of all, a little bit about where I'm from. So I'm from the Naval Research Lab in Monterey, California, and uh, it's a great place to uh, work and uh, spend time in Monterey. Um, our main campus is in Washington, D.C. Um, there's many divisions, divisions such as nanoscience, etc. Um, there's 2,500 employees in Washington, D.C. It was uh, started by Thomas Edison, some of you may not know that, um, in 1923, and it's been associated with many important um, projects over the years. Uh, Project Vanguard uh, was one of the first, if not the first, GPS came out of NRL. 
um, satellite tracking system, the mini track uh, system. Radar was really invented to, a, a, to at least refined to a large degree at NRL and invented. Um, fetal heart monitor actually came out of the NRL as well, so there's all sorts of interesting inventions that came out of it. So in Monterey, this is the Marine Meteorology Division. We're 110 people. We're a working capital fund, which means we have write proposals for our research and then do the research. Um, the mission is to better understand the environment, the coupled atmosphere, their mission impacts, so to help the Navy, so hopefully better simulating them to help the Navy do their mission more successfully, um, keep safe, um, and ultimately, like I said, help Navy personnel make better decisions. We're co-located with the um, Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Command, FINMOC, and this is Navy's Operational Weather and Ocean uh, Prediction Center. And so um, it's a really unique relationship because we're co-located on the same campus where we do operations and the model development. So there's a very close, tight link with um, operations and research. It's um, a unique, um, I think, um, aspect of uh, the Navy. We collaborate with lots of aspects of academia as well as uh, Naval Postgraduate School, Naval Academy as well. We have uh, sponsors, uh, ONR, NOAA, NASA, DOE, others. So we work with a lot of different um, funding agencies. Just one of the nice pictures of the Monterey coastline. So let's talk a little bit about the Arctic. So all of you are sure aware, first of all, can you hear me in the back okay? Is that all right? Okay, great. So the Arctic sea ice is in, uh, extent is in rapid decline. A lot of you or all of you I'm sure are aware of that. We have uh, increased air temperature. We now see multi-year sea ice loss. Um, the mean Sea ice thickness is being reduced. We see increased upper ocean fresh water, um, amplified ocean acidification, accelerated melting, for example, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, warming permafrost, changes in the balance of processes. The balances, the balances are so subtle in the Arctic, even a 10 watt per meter square change in the Arctic means that it'll have huge implications for sea ice melt or gain and new feedbacks. And this is just a figure that shows multi-year sea ice fraction from satellites. And you can see the rapid changes that have happened since the late 90s uh, to the present state, or near present state. The sea ice is thinning as well. This is from uh, one of Zach Lab's uh, uh, nice graphics that he does. And uh, you can see over the decades the thinning of the sea ice, the sea ice thickness in September, in meters, is shaded in color here, and then it's rapidly changing as well. So this thinning sea ice um, has potential impacts in that the uh, sea ice is more vulnerable to the atmosphere and ocean forcing. And um, one of the hypotheses we had going in is Arctic cyclones may be part of that. And I like to say that, um, you know, sort of from my personal perspective is fools rush in where angels fear to tread because we thought we knew something about cyclones and we know a little bit about sea ice that we should be able to contribute to this problem. And what we found is that it's much more complicated than we had imagined. So there's a lot of different facets to this problem. So the Office of Naval Research, ONR, um, has an initiative that's focused on quantifying the influence of Arctic cyclones on sea ice predictability. So the question is, if you're able to um, improve the prediction of Arctic cyclones, can you improve the predictability or, or predictions of sea ice extent, which would be very important to uh, not only the civilian population, but also the Navy as well. So let's take a look at a little bit of motivation. So Arctic cyclones are synoptic scale periclinic waves that have been hypothesized to impact sea ice loss because of strong surface winds. Um, an example is this cyclone in 2020 that uh, was in the Beaufort Sea, and um, it reached um, a central pressure of 975 hectopascals, passed through the marginal ice zone, and had a rather large impact. So this is July 21st, satellite imagery. You can see a pretty solid sea ice extent. Here's the cyclone in the middle of the month, and then, or the middle of the period, and then by the end of the month, you can see that it's uh, there's a lot of um, breaks in the sea ice as well. And 
there's circles to draw your attention to. So if we look at the National Snow and Ice Data Center analyses, you can see the thinning and sort of breaking up of the ice in this area where the cyclone was. So it looks very compelling. And uh, another one that received a lot of attention in the literature is a, a cyclone in 2012 called the, sometimes referred to as the Great Arctic Cyclone. Um, and this is just a, um, let's see, a 10 meter wind from the era five uh, reanalysis and sea level pressure, sea level pressure in black, winds in color, and you can see for one of these times, August 6th, it, um, it drawing up a lot of uh, air from the south, uh, very strong winds along the front side of the cyclone. And if we look at the cyclone track, we can see these are days of the month, so the 4th, 5th, 6th. Once it reached the 6th and 7th, it sort of slowed and did a meander and a loop and then continued to move along through August 11th. And here's the sea ice edge. And so these are daily 15% sea ice contours, and you can see the change in the sea ice with time as that cyclone was out there. So it appeared to have a big impact. And when we look at some of the time series now, so this goes from um, June 1st through the end of August, and you can see um, we have plotted here the sea ice extent anomaly of, from several different analyses, and SIDC, so this National Snow and Ice Data Center, era five, we have another one called Pyomass, Mara 2, and you can see all of them are kind of moving along, melting. Along comes the cyclone. You can see this period in the box is when the cyclone was happening. This is the kinetic energy in dashed lines so as a proxy for the winds. You can see that as the winds went very strong, you get a spike, and this is the period where you see a rapid decline in the sea ice. And so fine, and you can also see from the Pyomass analysis, the ice volume anomaly took a really strong decline during this period. So it looks very um, compelling. Um, so uh, we wanted to study this a bit further. So we had a coupled model that has been developed at NRL called the Navy ESPC, the Earth System Prediction Capability. This is a model that couples the Navy Global NavGem model with the Ocean Model HICOM, the SICE ICE model and Wave Watch 3 is coming in the future, it's not quite there yet. And what's unique about this model, it's pretty high resolution in the ocean and ice, one twelfth of a degree. So it's at nine kilometer resolution. And this is a bit unusual for a couple models. The actual atmospheric resolution is a little bit lower, 37 kilometers for the ensemble, the deterministic is 19 kilometers. Uh, this ensemble system is run now operationally with 16 members, zero to 45 days, and that's run once a week. And here you can see an animation of the HICOM uh, salinity um, for uh, just the eye candy and also um, sea ice uh, thickness from the SICE model in this coupled system. Just give you an idea of the fidelity of the system. Okay, so let's take a look at this in this coupled ESPC system. First of all, I so we're going to focus on the August 2012, this great Arctic cyclone case. And this is the 36-hour forecast from the model. And this is the era five, or era interim, sorry, reanalysis. And you can see they compare quite favorably between both of them. There's some differences, but overall uh, reasonably well captured. It's a kind of very large-scale cyclone. These cyclones in the Arctic tend to be uh, larger at least according to some of our anecdotal evidence, then uh, we see cyclones in the extra tropics. But overall, it looks reasonable. I should mention uh, this first part of the work comes from a paper that Dan Stern headed, and this appeared in GRL in the last couple of years. And so if we look a bit closer from the model, uh, some of the results, a nice thing of having a couple model, you can look at different processes and pick apart um, how these processes are contributing. So. Um, we have surface melting on the left, and uh, since I tend to get complaints that my figures are too small, I'll, I have these <laughs> zooms built in. So you can see the, uh, this region of, of where a lot of the air was coming from, uh, from the extra tropics. You can see a lot of this warm air leads to surface melting. So that process is um, operating very strongly. Um, you can see the air temperature, these warmer temperatures being drawn up into the Arctic in one of these warm, moist air streams that is atmospheric river-like. 
And so we see this really nice enhanced melting signature. If we now look at the surface energy budget on the right, we can see the different terms for the surface energy budget. Let's first look at the total energy flux in blue versus date in August. We can see a big spike associated with the cyclone, and that corresponded very nicely to the surface ice melt. So it looks very nice. We can break it into terms, and we see that there are two large terms that are present. One of them is the um, shortwave radiation, but the second one that we think is extremely important is the sensible heat flux that really drives the surface melting. So you have all this warm air coming up over the ice drawn by the cyclone, and you're getting surface melting. But that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is you have to look a bit, a bit uh, below the surface. And we see, because of the cyclone, we're getting um, enhanced melting at the um, bottom of underneath the ice uh, associated with warming from the sea surface. So you can see um, ice melting in this region where you see the red colors. You can also see 24-hour change in SSTs are large in this region where you got where you had a lot of stirring uh, due to the strong winds and the surface stresses that are mixing the upper part of the ocean. But if we take a closer look in a vertical cross section sense uh, here on the right, we can see this is from the high high model. This is a latitude depth cross section, so depth on the y axis, latitude on the x axis. And um, first of all, this is. Uh, the ocean temperature perturbation, and you can see some warm ocean temperatures that are below the surface. So you have some fresher water, fresh water lens above, and so some warmer temperatures below the surface that if you look at the 24 hour temperature change, you, see, you can see there's cooling in this layer and warming in the layer above. So there's been some mixing where the less dense fresh water above now has been mixed below with the warmer water um, higher salinity air, uh, water, I may, I may have said air by mistake, water back up to the surface. And so this is able to induce some more surface melting that it seems to be very important. So it's a very nice story so far. Oh, I forgot to zoom this one too. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> but we do have some challenges on the coupled model side. For one thing, um, I'll just note the uh, biomass um, model here in uh, the gray, I mentioned this earlier, had a big spike in terms of the ice thickness or ice volume. And you can see the ice volume change is very dramatic. And these different colored lines are forecasts initiated from different days during the ES, uh, for the ESPC system. You can see it's not really capturing that to the same degree. Um, and that's a little bit troubling. It's associated with natural, there are biases in these models. And when you have a coupled system, it's very challenging to get the um, budgets correct so that you don't have biases. So this is one of the challenges. And so this is another look at that. Of, and we don't necessarily think that biomass is the truth, but we want to better understand the differences between them. And so here, you know, this is the figure I just showed you before where the sea ice extent anomalies are, are decreasing rapidly during that period. Here's the biomass ice volume going down. The Navy ESPC, so the coupled system that is driven now by ERA-5, so we're kind of separating out any errors in the atmospheric model forecast, so we're driving it with reanalysis, and we still do not get the same sort of signature in biomass. So it could be that biomass is not correct, it's possible. But we want to better understand that. But this is, uh, nevertheless, underscores some of the challenges that we have uh, with these coupled models. So next, I want to shift gears a bit to um, reanalysis perspective of Arctic cyclones. So this is some work that Pete Finocchio um, has spearheaded and appeared in GRL in 2020. And uh, this is uh, a series of. Uh, kind of a deep dive into uh, the ERA-5 reanalysis looking at Arctic cyclones. So um, we went through the uh, ERA-5 data set, May and uh, concentrating in the period May to August, since we're interested more in the summertime cyclones when the sea ice tends to be thinner and ha may have an impact on the uh, sea ice, when the cyclones may have an impact on the sea ice. And we're looking from 1999 to 2018, 
We select cyclones that have a minimum central pressure of at least 1,000 millibars or lower, last at least 48 hours, and are within 500 kilometers of the sea ice edge, which we define to be 10 to 20 percent um, ice concentration. The change in sea ice extent are computed within a 500 kilometer radius of the cyclone for one to five days after the passage. So the cyclone cases we find are most frequent in the narrow marginal ice zone of the Atlantic sector of the Arctic in May and June. So these little dots are our cyclone cases, and these are the size of the dots indicate the maximum wind speeds. You can see the locations of these cyclones in May and June, and they transition more to the Siberian and Alaskan coasts and the marginal ice zones um, in July and August. And the number of cases we have for these uh, are shown for each month in this period. You can see some other statistics um, also for the uh, means and the maxes and so on. Okay, so um, just also to note that the ice edge is shown here and the 80% concentration is shown by this solid line. And so you can see how it's evolving from May to June to July to August as the sea ice begins to retreat. So what do the cyclone intensity distributions look like? So these are once again stratified by month, and we have these in box and whisker plots. So the um, median is shown, and we have the means shown here, the cyclone average, I mean the mean and the cyclone uh, average. The box and whiskers also show the tails. So the seven, these are 75 and 25% distributions, and these red um, circles are something that we did to try to tease out the cyclone versus non-cyclone conditions because you can imagine if you're looking at this during uh, the summer time period you have the arctic the background arctic climatological melt happening so you have to make sure that you don't confuse that with the impact of the cyclone so we have um, computed those averages for a set of non-cyclone cases randomly selected that i'll talk more about in a minute so you can see the distribution of these max wind speeds are in the 12 to 14 meter per second range. Um, and we can see there, you know, cyclones are weaker but more frequent as summer pro uh, progresses. You can see the number of cyclones, there's quite a few in August. So there's a lot of cyclones in August, August period. So now this is a, a little more of a complicated uh, graph and all. Um, talk this through a little bit more. So um, what you have here is the percent change in sea ice area, positive values indicating increased sea ice uh, cover, negative values indicating decreased sea ice cover. You have uh, three different colors here for the distributions. These are for one day in blue, three day in purple, and five day in uh, red. And so those are lagged quantities. Um, and so what we find overall, so also to note these circles again are for the non-cyclone statistics that are computed at the cyclone locations. And uh, they're using ERA-5 sea ice concentrations from randomly selected air, uh, years in the same location. So we're making sure we're sampling the same areas. So let's start out in May, and we can see, uh, first of all, um, the uh, percent change in sea ice cover, of course, is getting uh, greater with time of this time period as you go over the one to five day time period. But you find that actually the cyclone uh, induced or associated sea ice change is less than the non-cyclone, that for non-cyclones. It's actually the opposite of what we had anticipated uh, in the early part of the summer. Um, and so if we look at a little bit later, we tend to find uh, by August, we can see long tails for the cyclones. So we can see cyclones maybe uh, contributing to the sea ice loss, and now this, these non-cyclone cases are considerably less of a contributor. And we'll talk more about why that is and what's going on. But, so overall, the May-June cyclones are associated with less one to five day sea ice loss um, of local sea ice cover than non-cyclones. And the strong midsummer cyclones have a small average effect overall, but still nevertheless um, important, which we'll 
It's a very nuanced story, so we'll talk more about that. So um, what's going on with the, um, the short-term changes in sea ice and cyclones in the early part of the season? So we took a look at the surface energy flux differences in these. Now this is a, a plot that shows the cyclone minus non-cyclone conditions. So this is a, a delta change in terms of the energy flux versus month. And so negative values show that cyclones decrease the flux, positive values increase the flux. So we find that reduced ice loss from the early summer cyclones is associated mostly with cyclones blocking solar radiation from re uh, reaching the surface. So in other words, uh, we see in May and June, the sun is high in the Arctic. You get a lot of solar insulation. Cyclones are bringing in a lot of clouds, and that's helping to shield the uh, sea ice and is actually slowing the melt relative to clear sky conditions. So cyclones are actually um, uh, having the opposite effect that we thought initially in the Arctic in the early part. But then when we go to August, the early part of the summer, we go to August, cyclones have a smaller effect on the surface energy budget compared to other months. So the sun is lower in the horizon. And now this kind of sets the stage for the possibility of uh, cyclones having a bigger effect on sea ice in this late summer period. Okay, so, so there we have a couple uh, squares that focus on this energy balance. So the black is the overall net radiation. This yellow color is the change in the shortwave radiation. So you can see the large contributor to the delta shortwave or large contributor to the um, energy flux is the change in the short wave between the cyclone and non-cyclone conditions in the early part of the summer. You can see how much less it is of a contributor late in the summer period in August. So this is particularly important in May and June and July is like a transition month. The first part of July you see some of these effects and it's beginning to transition as the, uh, the sun is a bit lower on the horizon. So we can look at this a bit more um, and see that cyclones act to reduce the net short wave radiation within the marginal ice zone. And here we look at the different months, um, May, June in the Atlantic, May and June in the Pacific. And um, we see that these are the different cyclone sites. And uh, these black stippling indicate the places where the reduced short wave is happening associated with mid, it's associated with the uh, cloud fraction, so increased cloud fraction. So this is where the low and mid-level cloud fraction um, is increased by 15%, and uh, this uh, indicates that we have reduced uh, short wave in these regions. And so we find uh, through some of this analysis that cyclone clouds really prevent the strongest solar radiation from reaching uh, the surface and being absorbed in the marginal ice zone. So this um, is a very interesting effect. So if you want to melt, melt the sea ice, you don't want cyclones in the May-June time period. So it really underscores the importance of clouds predicting accurately clouds in the Arctic, which is an extremely hard problem, getting the radiation budget right. Can I interrupt you for yes, another question, of Jim? Please do. In the in the all-time minimum there in 2012 in September, was May and June of 2012 a little bit more cloud-free than average in some of these sensitive spots? Do you know? That's a great question. I'm not sure. I don't have the answer to that offhand, but that'd be very interesting to look up because I know um, the early part of the summer period did have it really set the stage for that minimum in September. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be okay. interesting to know. Thanks. And there has been some other studies, Heidi Wernley's group and others have kind of um, have underscored the importance of ridges in the Arctic, uh, especially early in the summer, that um, lead to these conditions, which makes a lot of sense, I think. So we can also look at um, the relationship to local sea ice change here across the um, summertime period. So the May, June, July, August. And uh, this is a bit of a complicated graph, so I'll walk you through this. So the redder colors indicate uh, the time scales for which the wind-driven infection, so we're looking at the infection, local change in sea ice due to sea ice infection, um, reduces sea ice cover around the cyclones. We're trying to figure out, does it have a lasting impact? Or is it 
the type of situation where you have a marginal ice zone, you have a cyclone, and ahead of the cyclone, um, it's bringing uh, the wind component across the sea ice, the marginal ice zone, the sea ice edge, uh, kind of uh, converging the ice, and behind it, um, you see ice divergence, in which case you wouldn't see a lasting impact in those cases. And you hope, um, or you, if you're tr trying to understand this, you would want to see a lasting impact if that's what you're trying to tease out. So here in these graphs, this uh, y-axis is the lagged interval in terms of days, size days, so a, a longer lagged interval size um, up here on the y-axis and longer wind average along the x-axis going out to uh, the interval size averaging of up to plus or minus five days. So in May, we have a near instantaneous winds and a rather short-term change, kind of an immediate response happens. And uh, you can see that it doesn't have very much of a lasting impact compared to, if we look at July and August, now we're seeing the average interval in terms of the winds uh, and longer on the right side of this, and we see the red colors uh, pretty far out, so they're having more of a longer uh, impact and there's a lagged response uh, for the Arctic cyclones. So that's a, sort of, it goes from an immediate ice infection that happens early in the summer to sort of a longer term effect that um, has a very lagged response following a cyclone in the late part of the summer. Okay, so part of the, the story in this analysis is that the climate record is obviously changing. So if you take Looking at, at over averages over three decades, it becomes very hard to interpret because the sea ice has changed during this period and you may be looking at different effects um, depending on where you are in that record. So one of the things we wanted to do was to compare and contrast the conditions in the early part of this um, era five reanalysis of this 90s versus the more recent decade. It's not a long, time period we're looking at here, but there have been significant changes in the sea ice behavior. This is uh, some new work that Pete Finocchio has led that uh, has just been submitted uh, to the journal Climate. And so let me walk you through these. This is the um, percent sea ice change within 500 kilometers of June cyclones on the left, August on the right. This is the percent change in sea ice extent, you know, zero and negative indicating a reduction. This is the lag in days out to seven. And the shading indicates, uh, and the error bars indicate the 95% confidence interval. So the shading for these dashed lines, the bars for the solids. Now, the blues are the earlier decade, the red colors are the latter decade. The lines are the cyclones, the dot, dotted lines are the non-cyclones. So here we are back in June. And so if we first look at the blue colors, we can compare the two and we can see not much difference in terms of if you keep within the 95% confidence <laughs> interval, not much difference between the cyclones and non-cyclones in June. But if you look at the more recent decade now in red, you can see a very large difference in the non-cyclone conditions relative to the cyclones. So the more recent decade, we're seeing a huge impact in terms of these you know, clear skies, non-cyclone conditions, the ridges um, are, are having a, a more uh, rapid sea ice loss during this period in the so-called New Arctic where we have thinner sea ice. Likewise, in August, we see the opposite effect where in the more recent decade, the cyclones are having a much bigger impact over relative to the cyclones um, back in the 90s. And they're having a much bigger impact than the non-cyclone conditions. So you can see a big separation between the two even. And so that's a very interesting that now with the thinner sea ice, we're hypothesizing that the, the non-cyclone conditions, the ridges, the solar insulation, the early part of the summer has a much bigger impact than the more recent time. And also the cyclone conditions in the late summer are disrupting the sea ice. So this, it seems like the sea ice is getting it from both ends now that it's thinner and it's definitely more vulnerable to uh, the environment. But there's more. <laughs> there's more to the story. So the, the other part of this story is the ocean. 
And you know, we talked about it earlier about how important the ocean could be and how you can get melting from below um, in the top part of the ocean that can melt the uh, bottom side of the sea ice. And so if, if we look at um, a global uh, high con reanalysis golf uh, 3.1, which came from the Naval Research Lab of uh, uh, the Ocean, Ocean Science Division in uh, Stennis, Mississippi. Uh, we look at upper ocean temperature profiles, and uh, this is some work that Pete has been doing as well. And uh, this just compares two different time periods, an earlier one, 1994 to 2000, with the later one, 2009 to 2015. And, um, you can see we've separated this into two different areas. One, an area over Eurasia, and the second one over the America and the eastern part of Asia that we call the Amerasian sector. And this is June along the top row, August along the bottom row, and you can already see some important differences. First of all, the, the Eurasian sector, you can see they differ between the two decades, but not greatly in terms of the ocean uh, stratification. You can see large differences that happen between June and August in this uh, more recent decade. If we look at, particularly in the August time period, uh, this most recent decade is showing much more of uh, warmer waters sneaking underneath uh, a much uh, cooler ocean layer that's likely due to um, some sort of uh, fresh water lens perhaps, and with this ocean, warmer ocean water below the surface, um, it's very uh, possible to mix that upward when you have uh, strong winds over the surface associated with cyclones that could mix up this warm water from below and melt it in the sea ice. So it's a, a really interesting story. Um, there, we're finding there is some uncertainty in the ocean reanalysis. Uh, Pete's looked at one other one that um, is uh, the overall message is not different, but there are details that are, are different, and, um, and that is important. They're not, there's not a lot of observations below the surface in the Arctic um, of the ocean. Okay, so um, the last section, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, some work we've done on Arctic cyclones and moisture transport into the Arctic. So moisture transport in, into the Arctic is really important, and it is occurring in part due to a response to cyclones. Um, it can be due to mid-latitude flow amplification. We've heard a lot about that in terms of Rossby wave breaking. The transport episodes are, uh, we refer to them as moist intrusions, but they're sometimes called uh, atmospheric rivers that contain high moist enthalpy flux that are injected poleward of 70 north. And the moist intrusions, are, of course, have great impl implications for clouds, Arctic warming, and sea ice melt. So it's not just the sea ice melt, but it's other aspects of the moist cycle. And so it naturally begs questions of uh, moisture transport into the Arctic. Where is it coming from, etc. So let me tell you a little bit about some work that Matt Fearon's done. Uh, this is uh, work that has been published in 2021. Um, that that has uh, spearheaded, and uh, we wanted to look at the relationship between these moist intrusions and cyclones because we went in thinking that cyclones are likely to be very important in terms of the poleward flux of moisture. And so he um, worked with the Era 5 um, reanalysis and also Michael Spranger's um, cyclone tracking database. And we married those two together. And we did some diagnostics of integrated vapor transport. So it's the vapor transport from the surface up to 300 millibars. And this is an example of the type of diagnostics that he did. He um, identified uh, segments. Well, here you can see these segments of poleward moving moist intrusions that are crossing the 70 north latitude uh, line. And um, you can see sea level pressure here in black. These dots indicate the center of the cyclones. So there's a cyclone there, there's a cyclone there, there's a moist intrusion there, there's a cyclone here with another moist intrusion. And so we wanted to look at the 
connection between the cyclones and these atmospheric river type of features. So the climatology for cyclones across the year by season uh, for winter, spring, summer, and autumn are shown in the top row. And we can see um, in the winter months you have a corridor of cyclogenesis activity or cyclones moving up into the Arctic between Greenland and Scandinavia, very common. And it continues in spring. In summer you can see other areas uh, that are popping up of increased cyclone activity. In autumn it's sort of back to a more limited um, channels into the Arctic. And then if we look at these intrusions, we find um, these intrusions are shaded um, in terms of their grid cell counts. And you can see these intrusions closely follow some of these um, cyclone activity regions. And when we reach the summer months, um, you can see that there's multiple corridors um, in this uh, gap between Greenland and Scandinavia, but you could also see some Eurasian uh, sources of these intrusions that correspond to these cyclones in, in the summer as well. So we want to look at some of those a bit closer. So here we have the circle. So this is actually kind of a surprising statistic, at least it was to me, that on average cyclones account for about 74% of the annual moisture transported to the Arctic and about 81% in summer. So the, the a lot of the moisture is arriving into the Arctic through these narrow atmospheric rivers that are generated by the site, that are attached to these cyclones and they're associated with these deformation regions and they're moving into the Arctic and are critically important. So one of the things Matt did was he took back trajectories from that 70 degree latitude line and wanted to better understand the sources of the moisture for these. And so looking at the different months, you can see uh, the different source regions. In the winter, you find um, source regions over Europe and the North Atlantic and the spring similar places. In the summer, you can see really strong uh, source regions over Eurasia and Europe. You can see other ones extending over Canada and some over Alaska too. And a lot of these are over land actually, over the there's source regions certainly over um, the North Atlantic as well. But a lot, we see these maxima in the high latitudes over the Arctic. So um, if you look at the monthly latent heat flux averaged over these time periods, you can see um, for, particularly for June and July and even into August, the really strong latent heat fluxes over the continent <coughs> as these high latitude regions begin to thaw and you get permafrost uh, melt and thawing um, and contributing to larger moisture flux that is uh, available for uptake into the atmosphere. So we have a square around July and I think that basically says when I did a nice circle around it, sorry I didn't really follow through on this, but you can see a, a nice uh, region in July especially of, of the strong latent heat flux. So we did some experiments with our mesoscale model called COAMPS, and this is a non-hydrostatic mesoscale model. We simulated a really strong cyclone in August of 2016, and you can see the track of this cyclone here, and uh, the central pressure trace showing here, it goes down to about 970 after about um, four days or so in the Arctic, in this black line. And we looked at this cyclone at a period where it was deepening, and these are the pressure contours below 1,000 millibars. It was 983 at this point. And that did some back trajectories, and they shaded these by the um, mixing ratio. And so the darker blues are moist, and the lighter colors are drier. And you can see these trajectories, back trajectories, end up over the continent. And they actually have a little bit of a anticyclonic curl here. And so what happens is these trajectories are descending, probably in an anticyclone, and they arrive either in the PBL or just above the PBL and are getting moistened and being picked up by the transport north within this atmospheric river as the cyclone and its track shown here begin to move northward. And so um, Matt ran a very nice sensitivity test where he 
reduced the soil moisture by 50%. And he reduced it, uh, not everywhere, but in this um, region um, in yellow. And you can see a large difference in terms of the uh, mixing ratio that enters into the Arctic between these two. You can see much uh, lighter colors, lighter blues that are, the mixing ratio is reduced by two, three, four grams per kilogram in that region. This results in the cyclone at this time being um, weaker by about uh, seven millibars, and you can see the overall intensification is really slowed down and changed. So um, this, we think, is a really important finding because it underscores the connection between what's happening on the, in the land surface over Eurasia during the late part of the summer and how that contributes to moisture in the Arctic, so moistening within these atmospheric river features. Oh, so I want to show also a cross section across these trajectories, this atmospheric river feature. This is a vertical <coughs> section, isotropes in, um, in solid lines, black, and the shading is the, um, is the mixing ratio. And you can see the reduction by reducing soil moisture by 50%, you can see quite a bit less moisture in that region. And you can see if you reduce the soil moisture to zero, you get very little. And so that's a very surprising. So there's a very big impact on uh, the amount of moisture transported, but also an impact on the boundary layer and its structure as well. And I thought, uh, since I'm a person who does a lot of work on adjoints, and I know Michael and Zoe are big fans of adjoints as well, I thought I'd put in an adjoint result too. So we have um, a sim the same case we're looking at, but a different period of time where we put a box around these high winds. So this is 10 meter wind speeds. This is the cyclone where it had a central pressure of 988 millibars. And um, we uh, computed the adjoint over a 72 hour time period. And I will say that using an adjoint in the Arctic is a, a great experience because it's not as <laughs> subject to nonlinearities associated with convection. So it's quite a bit more well behaved. And I just want to show the sensitivities that we find uh, to the initial moisture field. So this is over the 72-hour forecast sensitivity to the initial moisture. So the moisture, uh, the, the initial moisture is shaded in color. So I didn't choose a great uh, color scheme here. The, the contours are the moisture sensitivity. And you can see a lot of it is located over the continent um, in uh, Western Europe and extending into Russia. And you can see some pluses and minuses that are very interesting and uh, suggesting and sort of underscoring the result that we found with the trajectories that a lot of the moisture in the low levels are ex extremely important for the cyclone itself. So that's, uh, I think, an interesting result. I'll skip that in sort of uh, last part and I'll just mention that um, we have a field program planned for this coming summer, and we are working with the French group uh, that have access to the Sapphire uh, prop plane. It's called the ATR-42. It's an instrumented aircraft. It includes um, Doppler LiDAR. It also included so Doppler cloud radar, and uh, able to get at the clouds and microphysics, which we think are very important. So we'll be able to uh, have measurements of that. But Aircraft will be flying out of Svalbard for three weeks um, in August, and we're hoping to measure some uh, aspects of uh, Arctic cyclones. And there are all, also some uh, nice microphysical measurements on board the aircraft as well that um, we look forward to um, analyzing. And I should also mention that, I should go back, um, also mention that we're working with the a UK group, um, John Nathan and Ian Renfrew, and they will have access, they will be using the British Antarctic Survey um, Twin Otter, which will be flying near the ice edge uh, north of Svalbard and taking measurements in the boundary layer. So there's a possibility of in tandem taking very coordinated measurements of a Arctic cyclone and getting measurements near the ice edge and being able to actually see uh, so get some observations of how Arctic cyclones are affecting the sea ice. 
want to mention one other um, observing program that we have coupled with this is associated with uh, a company called Windborn, and they're a group of young scientists from Stanford that have designed a, a kind of a slick radio sound system that has a ballast in it, and it's remotely controlled ballast, so that the balloon can move up and down um, at their control, so it can sample different winds in the atmosphere. So in some ways, you can steer the balloons to some degree. And last year, we had a pilot experiment where we launched from Alaska and also from Svalbard. You can see the blue ones are from Alaska. The red tracks are from Svalbard. And you can see we sampled all sorts of different parts of the Arctic, and some of them were we vectored towards Arctic cyclones, so it was very interesting. And as these move along, they have an instrumented package, just like a radio sun, that they need, for accurate measurements, you want to aspirate the instruments, because they, you know, if you're moving along with the wind, you're not getting any sort of flow next to the instruments, so you want some aspiration. So what they tend to do is have the, um, have these sons be moving up and down, taking profiles in the atmosphere as they're moving along. Um, so you're getting like full um, soundings as these move uh, along in the jet or whatever part of the, uh, the vortex that you might be sampling. The other cool thing is that they're very lightweight. So they're under any sort of FAA type of regulation. So we, you know, you can see we're moving into places over the continent and elsewhere that um, we normally don't get to access. So we've done some comparisons versus Air 5 reanalysis. Matt Kieran did this and, and so did the Windward group and found reasonable RMS values for uh, temperature winds and a little bit larger in relative humidity. We found about a half degree cold bias in the temperatures, but still overall excellent. And so we're now um, doing some impact studies that are underway at both NRL using COAMPS and, and the ECOWF as well. We use the adjoint uh, to provide targeting information for this as well. So we tried to diagnose where the forecast might be sensitive for these cyclones and ask the, the folks to steer some balloons that way to take some observations in those sensitive areas to see if those have greater impacts on the forecast. So we'll be using those again in uh, 2022. Okay, so let me summarize. So the melting of sea ice we found can be substantially enhanced by intense cyclones. For example, the 2012 cyclone or the 2016 cyclone. We find that the melting occurs through turbulent mixing of warm waters from below and sensible heating from above. We've looked at a large sample of Arctic summer cyclones located near the sea ice edge using reanalysis. We find this interesting result that the early summer cyclones slow the uh, seasonal sea ice loss uh, due to the clouds that block solar insulation. Uh, the quiescent conditions in June and cyclone, cyclone conditions in August, we find are increasingly capable of accelerating sea ice loss in the so-called new Arctic. So the this most recent uh, time period where the Arctic uh, sea ice is thinning is greatly enhancing the uh, likelihood of the environment having uh, impact on the sea ice. We also found cyclones overall account for a great deal of moisture that's transported into the Arctic. And we found this interesting result that the land surface is a very important moisture source uh, into the Arctic as well. So it really, you know, the impact of summer Arctic cyclones on sea ice remains a really complex and uncertain problem, and it's due to offsetting physical effects, uh, representativeness when we've looked at extreme cases, and we have model and remote sensing errors and uncertainties. So we're hoping this campaign I talked about will help shed some new light on it, and um, you know, we think that they're really an important and complex component of sea ice variability um, in terms of climate, and we want to better understand it for not only improving sub-seasonal forecasts, but also climate projections as well. And I'll stop there, and just to note that these are uh, four papers that contributed, uh, that you saw results from in this study, and uh, once again, uh, you know, kudos to the team that uh, have contributed to this, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Zoe? Um, have you looked at the angle of incidence? So when a, a cyclone is going over the ice edge, whether it's perpendicular <coughs> versus parallel to it, whether that has an impact, and then also breaking that down by month of the year, if that could explain whether springtime you're getting more perpendicular translation right. across it? Yeah, that's a great question. We um, So one of the things that Pete Finocchio was doing was breaking down the, compo the wind components, whether they're across, the complication is that the ice edge is often not straight either, so that makes it complicated. So he was breaking down the wind components that are perpendicular to the ice edge. So whether it's on ice or off ice, trying to get at the very question you're asking. And there is, there, there are some interesting nuanced results from it, but it's, it's pretty complicated to um, interpret, I think. But I think we can see, we can identify uh, those cyclones that are affecting ice around versus ones that have a permanent change in the sea ice or lasting change is a better way to say it. So I think it is important and especially important is this component, wind component across the sea ice. Um, whether the cyclone's moving along it or across it, um, the, they both factor in. And the other thing is how long the cyclone is lasting along that sea ice edge. Is it a slow moving one? Is it moving, like you said, perpendicular to the sea ice or moving along it? And all those factors seem to matter. Yeah. It's a good question. I don't have a nice pithy answer to it. Sorry. John? Yeah, really interesting, Jeff. And congrats to the group. They've done great work on this. It's really great. Um, non cyclone days. Is uh, I think from what I got from your talk is any time where a grid point or the region around it has a sea level pressure not involved in a cyclone with a with sea level pressure less than a thousand. Right. So it could mean a lot of things. Could mean a bona fide anti cyclone. It could be mean space between weak cyclones or something yes. like that. How many of those days and under what conditions is fog a substantial uh, factor that you know eliminates the uh, the benefit of the insulation? Yeah, great question. We haven't looked at that. We hadn't considered that, but that really is a good question because, you know, obviously fog in the Arctic can happen in, the, in these conditions. Um, we have looked, so we, I did present the radiation budget that shows overall in the mean, we could see the, uh, the change in this in the short wave incoming short wave radiation is significant between the two. Yeah. You can see that's a big contributor, but I'm not sure we never drilled down into which cases do you not see that and are those fog cases or somehow stratus cases. There's a lot of yeah. clouds in the Arctic yeah. and um, both of those could very well be important factors. So I think that's a good question. Because I wonder if you have um anti-cyclones above a certain threshold of surface pressure intensity, if those are more likely to be cloud free, and then that kind of yeah. gives you pairs of disturbances you might want to look at in June, July, and uh, even into August. Yeah. One of them wanes and one of them waxes, maybe. Yeah, that's a good question. We sort of um, got away from identifying anti-cyclones just because of, of the statistics and how it cuts down on the number of cases. So we, yeah. we thought just cyclone versus non-cyclones to allow us to um, test the hypotheses, hypothesis with uh, sufficient cases. But yeah. I think there is compelling evidence that the anti-cyclones, you know, from some of the literature I've seen, um, can have significant impact in that early part of the mm -hmm. season. From Thanks. Andy Wormley's group, for example. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, I was really interested in your, uh, the moisture sensitivity experiment with the permafrost. Yes. Um, I don't know if this question makes sense, but I was wondering how, like, how robust is your soil moisture model? Is it just observations that you're running forward, or like, is there some sort of dynamic component to the soil moisture? So, um, in the in the CoAMPS model, we're using the NOAH, the NOAA land surface model, and it's initialized from the land surface information system, the LIST system, which is the NASA system, and it's a dynamic model with four layers in the soil. And uh, it's, you know, pretty, uh, I'm sure it's not the 
end all for soil models, but I think it's, it's sufficiently sophisticated for the time scales that we look at. It's okay. not, not so sophisticated like um, some climate models that actually grow crops and et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it, I think is a reasonable representation of the land surface for the short to medium range forecasting. It's the same, it's the same land surface model that uh, basically is used by um, NOAA also for their models. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the same. And I think it's one of the options within WARF as well. Yeah. How, how easy is it to, uh, to get that observation at the same time as there is a cyclone going over it? Like if they're getting, I don't know how they're getting observations. Oh, you mean like actual observation? What goes into the observation? Yeah, like how are they initializing it? Yeah. It's a great question. I'm not an expert on this, but I know the initial conditions that came for the soil uh, were for the, from this list system, and they have a number of different satellite ops that contribute to that, as, including the SMAP, which is the soil moisture something something, and um, they have a number of different satellites that they use to um, to um, provide estimates of soil moisture, and so they have the simulation system at NASA that um, brings all that together in an offline system, and we make use of those initial conditions. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, does the average sea ice thickness also change uh, from like May to August in the sea ice edge region that you're analyzing? And I don't know like, if you talked about this in the talk I missed it, but if it does, then does that have an impact on like, the, of the, on the results that you're seeing with the contrast between the May, June, and July? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> the sea ice thickness is definitely you know, the climatological melt, it's definitely thinning as you go into late summer. So it's definitely a contributing factor into um, the fact that these cyclones are having an important impact. And it's um, amplified by the fact that in the more recent time period, in the more recent decade, for example, um, the sea ice is thinning overall. And that, you know, sort of, uh, along with the climatological melt, makes the sea ice even thinner, which makes these environmental conditions, like whether it's incoming shortwave radiation earlier in the summer, or the um, cyclones themselves with the stronger winds that can either break up the sea ice, either through wave action, or bring warmer water up to the surface, um, completely uh, kind of a multiplier. So the, the thickness is extremely important. Yeah, so that's right. And is uh, just a quick follow-up, like is, uh, do you have like a good data set for the like, cooler thickness? I think there like, are uh, a lot of biases in models regarding that, or? Yeah, the sea ice thickness, as I understand, I'm not a sea ice expert, um, but getting the sea ice thickness is a big challenge. And um, uh, the, there are data sets like the biomass um, reanalysis, the biomass model that um, does provide sea ice thickness and sea ice volume estimates. And there are uh, new, newer satellites uh, through uh, some uh, retrievals, I think, that can get at sea ice thickness. Like, is it, what's the most recent one? Sea, sea ice sat two? Ice sat two. Ice sat two. I think is the one that you can get some estimates of sea ice that people have been deriving from. But I think it's a hard quantity to uh, to measure and have observations of, but an extremely important one. If there is anything we would want, it would be more of the sea ice thickness than the extent, I think, that would probably tell us more that, you know, that's an important part of the problem that we don't know enough about. I mean, it seems like there's too, it's like one of those problems where there's too many unknowns to try to try to figure this out. Or what about the extent of ice below a certain threshold thickness? That yeah. might be even the best thing to know. That would be the right. best thing to know, probably. Yeah. Because then it differentiates between cyclones in August just being, you know, adornment to the season. Yeah. 
or is it May and June that really determines what happens in September? You know, that that's right. yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you partition the ocean into Euro Asia and Maria Asia, does is it because uh, you, you see less of the cultural change in uh, Pacific Ocean? Is it because the overturning circulation, Meridiano overturning circulation, is less uh, impactful than the AMOC? That could very well be. We, um, I have to admit, we don't have a good understanding of that, but there are certainly are significant differences as you alluded to between the two bases that could be very important. So I think that's uh, plausible. I think that's a very good comment. Yeah, thank you for that. Great. Are changes in vegetation and permafrost region important uh, to, to this moisture flux that you seem to be getting from there? I think it's possible. I think that's a very good question. and. Um, you know, it's the permafrost and the vegetation in the in the high latitudes in the Arctic and the subarctic have gotten a lot of attention um, because of CO2 implications. Um, we know that um, different types of vegetations have different types of vegetation have um, you know show different behavior as far as evapotranspiration. So very well be there may be some important implications about that, but we haven't considered that. At the very least, it changes albedo, I would think. That's right. Albedo is kind of king in the Arctic, and that could be really important. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Can I just follow up on that? I, I certainly think the vegetation can have a pretty large impact on the moisture budget. It's just got out of the thesis defense showing that over land, it's like two-thirds of all evapotranspiration is going through plants, right? Right. And under higher CO2, you would actually expect to model closure, and so you could actually have a reduction in moisture transport even for the same soil moisture, um, which might be a really interesting kind of feedback. And yeah, I don't know. There could be some neat things if you put in the vegetation on top of that. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a fascinating. And, um, you know, it wasn't a component of the Earth system that we entered into this that we thought was important, but we ended up finding that, hey, it's even more complicated than we thought. Quick question that goes back to a question that John asked. It was earlier in your presentation, you were showing, you defined the sort of cyclone days, non cyclone days, and you showed a distribution for each of the months. Right. And there are these dots that seem to progress from around Greenland to sort of north of. Where was that? Probably this way. Right. I was wondering, is the location of these dots more a function of how you define? the cyclones themselves, these Arctic cyclones, or is it is indicative of something about the storm track progression over that portion of the year? You see a lot of them around Greenland, and then they seem to be migrating like, into the other side of the uh, hemisphere. I think the way we define the cyclones is pretty standard. I think it's telling us something about the storm track, is yeah. my understanding. And when you enter into the period in, later in the summer, there uh, the land is starting to heat up quite a bit, and you start to end, uh, enter into a period where you have a secondary um, kind of semi-permanent periclitic zone along the Eurasian coast that may be driving some of this storm track activity. Um, so I think it's telling us something about the storm track and how radically it changes through the uh, summer. That is a, a great observation. Plus, they're also only the ones yes. that are within 500 kilometers. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So there's, there's, there's the ice age. That's age right. Yeah. But nonetheless, that's there's something else beyond that. Yeah. That's right. It's not the entire storm track, right. which would look very different. Any further questions? Can I ask one more? Oh, sure. in the room. <laughs> Got it. Maybe it won't be so much to Jim, although you probably know. What's the water budget? What's the water mass budget of the permafrost? How does it? Let's say you have a really warm, dry summer and you evaporate, first you melt it, then you evaporate some of that water and it's not replenished in the autumn. Does that do substantial, have a big impact on the permafrost next year? It would seem like it would. I don't know. I'm not a, I don't have expertise in that, but I would think it would. Yeah. I mean, one thing we have seen, right, there's been an expansion of fire seasons through Siberia. Mm -hmm. It suggests right. that there's kind of this soil moisture feedback going on, but yeah, I don't know. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Great question.
Well, let's thank our speaker again. So thanks again to everyone for...